from around the globe, it's the Cube, presenting Cube on Cloud, brought to you by SiliconANGLE. Hey everybody, to Cube on Cloud. My name is Dave Vellante, and I'll be here throughout the day with my co-host John Furrier, who is quarantined in an undisclosed location in California. He's all good. Don't worry, it's just precautionary. John, how are you doing? Hey Dave, great to see you. Doing quarantine. Um, my youngest daughter had COVID, so contact traced. I was negative and quarantine at a friend's location. All good. Well, but, we, know, wish, we wish everybody. her and you the best. Yeah, well, right. I mean, you know, what's it like, John? I mean, you're away from your family. You're, you're basically shut in, right? I mean, you go out for a walk, but you're really not in any contact with anybody, correct? No, I mean, basically just isolation, um, pretty much what everyone's been kind of living uh, and kind of suffering through, but hopefully the vaccines are being distributed. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things we talked about at reInvent, uh, Amazon's cloud conference was the vaccine um, and just the whole workflow around that. It's got to get better. It's kind of really sucky here in the California area. They haven't done a good job. A lot of criticism around how that's rolling out. And, you know, Amazon's now offering to help now that there's a new regime in the, in the U.S. <laughs> government. Um, so, you know, something to talk about, but certainly this has been a um, terrible time for COVID and everyone and the deaths involved, but it's, it's essentially pulled back the covers, if you will, on technology and you're seeing everything in society. In fact, um, whether it's big tech, disinformation campaigns, all these vulnerabilities and cyber um, accelerated digital transformation, which we'll talk about a lot today, um, but yeah, it's totally changed the world. And I think, we're in a new generation. I think this is a real inflection point, Dave, uh, you know, in modern society. And the geopolitical impact of this is significant. You know, one of the benefits of being quarantined, you can be hanging out on these clubhouse apps uh, late at night, listening to experts talk about what's going on. And it's interesting what's happening with, with uh, things like water and, you know, the island of Taiwan and China and US sovereignty, data sovereignty misinformation, mm -hmm. so much going on to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, meanwhile, companies like Mark Andreessen's BC firm starting a media company. <laughs> what, right. What's going on? Hell's freezing over. So we're going to be talking about a lot of that stuff today. I mean, Cuba on cloud, it's our very first virtual editorial event. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do is bring together our community. It's, a, it's an open forum. And we're, we're running the day on our 365 software platform. So we got a great lineup. We got CEOs, CIOs, data practitioners. We got hardcore technologists coming in, cloud experts, investors. We got some analysts coming in and we're creating this day long series. And we've got a number of sessions that we've developed and we're going to unpack the future of cloud computing in the coming decade. As John said, we're going to talk about some of the public policy, uh, new administration. What does that mean for tech and for big tech in general? John, what can you add to that? Well, I think one of the things, and you may, we talked about COVID, this is personal impact to me, but other people as well. One of the things that people are craving right now is information, factual information, truth, uh, tech truth as we call it. But here, this event for us, Dave, it's our first inaugural editorial event. Rob Pope, Kristen Nicole, the entire CUBE team, Silicon Angle, really trying to put together more of a cadence. We're going to do more of these events where we can put out and feature the best people in our community that have great fresh voices. You know, we do interview the big names, Andy Jassy, Michael Dell, the billionaires, the people making things happen, but it's often the people under them that are the, the real newsmakers. Uh, Amit Zavri, for instance, at Google, one of the most impressive technical people, he's got a talk, he's going to present the democratization of software development and many more real people making things happen. And I think there's a communal element and we're going to do more of these. Obviously we have uh, no events to go to it's with the cube. So, we have the Cube virtual software that we have been building and over years and now perfecting. And we're going to introduce that. We're going to put it to work. We're dog fooding it. And we're going to put that software to work. We're going to do a lot more virtual events like this. Cube on cloud, Cube on startups, Cube on raising money, Cube on healthcare, Cube on venture capital, all those things. We can do anything. The question is what's the right story? What's the most important story? Who's telling it and, and, and increase the aperture of the lens of the industry that we have and, and expose that and fast as possible. And that's what this software is. You'll see more of it. So it's super exciting. We're going to add new features like pulling people up on stage, um, kind of bring on the clubhouse vibe and more of a community interaction where people can meet each other and we'll, we'll roll those out. But the goal here is to just showcase the cloud story in a way from people that are living it and providing value. So enjoy the day. It's going to be chock full of presentations. Uh, we're going to have moderated chat. 
in these sessions. So it's an all day event. So people can come in, drop out. And also that's everything's on demand immediately after the time slot. But if you yes. want to participate, come into the time slot, into the cube room or breakout session, whatever you want to call it. It's a cube room and there'll be the people in there chatting and having a watch party. So when you're on that homepage, when you're watching, there's a hero video there and beneath that there's a calendar and you'll see that red line is that red horizontal line, the vertical line is rather, it's a, it's a, a linear clock that will show you where we are in the day. If you click on any one of those sessions, it'll take you into the chat. We'll take you through those in a, in a moment and, and share with you some of the guests that we have up, upcoming and, and take you through the day. What I wanted to do, John, is, is try to set the stage for the conversations that folks are going to hear today. And, and, and to do that, I want to ask the guys to bring up a graphic and I want to talk to you, John, about the progression of cloud over time and maybe go back to the beginning and review the evolution of cloud and then really talk a little bit about where we think it's, it's headed. So guys, if you bring up that graphic, when AWS announced S3, it was March of 2006. And as you recall, John, you know, nobody really in the vendor and user community, they didn't really pay too much attention to that. And then later that year in August, it announced the EC2 the people really started, they started to think about a new model of computing, but they were largely, you know, kicking tires and it was kind of bleeding edge developers that really leaned in. Um, what, what were you thinking at the time when you, when you saw uh, of S3, EC2, this retail company coming into <laughs> the tech world? I mean, I thought it was totally crap. I'm like, this is far terrible. But then at that time I was thinking working on, I was in between kind of startups and I didn't have a lot of uh, seed funding. And then I'm, I realized EC2 was freaking awesome. And I'm like, holy shit, this is really great because I don't need to pay a lot of cash to provision a data center or get a server. Or, you know, at that time, state of the art startup move was to buy a super micro box or some sort of power server. Um, it was well past the whole proprietary thing, but you had to assemble probably be anywhere between five to eight grand a box and go in and, what I would call a ghetto rack, which is basically, uh, uh, you know, you put it into some hosting <laughs> location. It's like with everybody else and the tech ghetto of hosting, still paying monthly fees and then maintaining it and, and provisioning. Yeah. That's just to get started. And then Amazon was just really easy. And then from there, you just, it was just awesome. I just knew Amazon would be great. They had a lot of things that they had to fix you know, custom domains, user interface, console got better and better, but it was awesome. Well, what we really saw uh, the cloud take hold from my perspective anyway, was the financial crisis in, in 07 to 09. It put cloud on the radar of a number of CFOs and of course shadow IT departments. They wanted to get stuff done and, and, and take IT in, in, in OPEX bite-sized chunks. So it really was like this cloud awakening and we came out of that financial crisis and this, we're now in this 10 year plus boom, um, you know, notwithstanding obviously the economic crisis with COVID, but much of it was powered by the cloud and the decade I would say was really about IT transformation and kind of ironic if you will, because the pandemic it hits at the beginning of this decade and it creates this mandate to go digital. So you've, you've said a lot, John, it's pulled forward, it's accelerated this industry transformation Everybody talks about that, but and we've highlighted it here in this graphic. And it probably would have taken several more years to mature, but overnight you had this forced march to digital. And if you weren't a digital business, you were kind of out of business. And, and so it's sort of here to stay. How, how do you see, you know, what this evolution and what we can expect in the coming decade? It's, it, it, I think it's safe to say the last 10 years um, were defined by, you know, IT transformation. That's not going to be the same in the coming years. How, how do you see it? Uh, it's interesting. I think the big tech companies are, um, and I think this past election in the United States shows um, the power that technology has. And if you look at some of the main trends in the enterprise, specifically around what cloud's accelerating, I call the second wave of innovations coming where um, it's different. It's not what people expect. It's edge, edge computing, for instance, is talked about a lot, but industrial IoT is really where the where we've had a lot of problems lately in terms of hacks and malware and just, just overall vulnerabilities, whether it's, supply chain vulnerabilities to actual disinformation, you know, uh, you know, vulnerabilities uh, inside these networks. Um, so I think this network effect uh, is going to be a huge thing. I think the impact that tech will have on society and global society, geopolitical things is going to be also another one. Um, I think um, the modern application development of how applications are written with data, you know, we always 
been saying this day from the beginning of the cube, data is the is an integral part of the development process. And I think more than ever, when you think about cloud and edge and this distributed computing paradigm the cloud is now going next level with is the software and how it's written will be different. You got to handle things like where's the compute component? Is it going to be at the edge with all the server uh, chips innovations that Amazon, Apple, Intel are doing? You're going to have compute right at the edge, industrial and kind of human edge. Um, how does that work? What's the latency to that? It's It really is an edge game. So to me, software has to be written holistically in a systems impact kind of way. Now that's not necessarily new in the computer science and in the tech field, it's just going to be deployed differently. So that's a complete rewrite in my opinion of the software applications, which is why you're seeing uh, Amazon, Google, uh, VMware really pushing Kubernetes and these uh, service meshes and these microservices because super critical that this technology becomes smarter, automated, autonomous. And that's completely different paradigm than the old full stack developer, you know, kind of model. You know, the full stack developer is ancient. There's no such thing as a full stack developer anymore, in my opinion, because it's a half a stack because the cloud takes up the other half, <laughs> but no one wants to be called a half stack developer because it doesn't sound as good as full stack, but really cloud has eliminated the technology complexity of what a full stack developer used to do. Now you can manage it and do things with it. So, you know, there's some work to done, but the heavy lifting has been taken care of. It's the top of the stack that I think is going to be a really critical component. Yeah, and that that sort of automation and, and machine intelligence layer is really at the top of the stack. This this thing becomes ubiquitous and we now start to build businesses and new processes on top of it. I want to I want to take a look at the big three. And guys, can we bring up the other the next graphic? Uh, which is an estimate of what the revenue looks like uh, for the for the big three. And John, this is IaaS and, and pass spend for the big three cloud players. And, and it's, it's, it's an estimate that we're going to update after earnings seasons. And I want to point a couple things out, out here. First is if you look at the, the combined revenue production of the big three last year, it's almost 80 billion in infrastructure spend. I mean, think about that. That's, <laughs> was that an incremental spend? No, it, it really has caused a lot of consolidation in the on-prem data center business for guys like Dell and you know, EMC now part of Dell, HPE split up, IBM, Oracle, I mean, it's, et cetera, et cetera. They've all felt this sea change and they've had to respond to it. I think the second thing is you can see on this data, um, it's true that Azure and GCP, they seem to be growing <clears throat> faster than AWS. We don't know the exact numbers, because AWS is the only company that really provides a clean view of IaaS and PaaS, whereas Microsoft and Google, they kind of hide the ball in their numbers. I mean, I don't blame them because they're behind, uh, but they do leave breadcrumbs and clues about growth rates and so forth. And so we have other means of estimating, but it's it's undeniable that Azure is, 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 is catching up. I mean, it's still quite distance. The third thing, and then before I want to get your input here, John is, and this is nuanced, but despite the fact that Azure and Google the growing faster than AWS, you can see those growth rates. AWS, and I'll call this out, is the only company by our estimates that grew its business sequentially last quarter. Now, in and of itself, that's not significant, but what is significant is because AWS is so large, they're $45 billion last year, even at the slower growth rates, it's able to grow more in absolute terms than its competitors who are basically flat to down sequentially by our estimates. Uh, so. So that's something that I think is important to point out. Everybody focuses on the, the growth rates, but it's, you got to look at yeah. also the absolute dollars as well. And nonetheless, it, it, Microsoft in particular, they're, they're closing the gap steadily. And, and we should talk more about the competitive dynamics, but I'd love to get your take on, on all this, John. Well, I mean, the, the clouds are going to win right now, big time with the um, one, the political climate is going to be favoring big tech. Um, but more importantly, with we just talking about COVID impact and accelerating the digital transformation, is going to create a massive rising tide. It's already happening, it's happened, it's happening. And again, the shift in programming uh, uh, models are going to really kind of accelerate and create new great growth. So there's no doubt in my mind that all three are going to win big um, in the future. They're just different. You know, the, the way they're going to market and position themselves, they have to be, Google has to be a little bit different than Amazon because they're smaller and they also are, have different capabilities and trying to catch up. So. If you're Google or Microsoft, you have to have a competitive strategy to decide how do I want to make, you know, ride the tide, if you will, if it's a rising tide. 
well, if I'm Amazon, I mean, if I'm Microsoft and Google, I'm not going to try to go frontal and try to copy Amazon because Amazon is just pounding lead of, of mm. features and, and scale and they're different. They were, I would say, take advantage of the first move of a pure public cloud. They are really awesome at PaaS and IaaS, they've integrated in. Gartner now reports an integrated IaaS and PaaS component. Yep. So Gartner finally got their act together and said, hey, this is really one thing. SaaS is a completely different animal. Now Microsoft's super smart because they, I think they played the right card. They have a huge install base, converted to Q, uh, Office 365 and move SQL Server and all their core jewels into the cloud as fast as possible and cloudify them while filling in the gaps on the product side to be cloud. So, you know, Azure's doing a, a tremendous job. They're just, it's just pedal as fast as you can, but Microsoft is really the strategy is just go faster, try to <laughs> keep pedaling fast, get the features, feature velocity, and try to make it high quality. Google yeah. is a little bit different. They have a little power base in terms of their network is strong and they have a lot of other uh, big data capabilities. So they have to use those to their advantage. So there is, there is there is competitive strategy gamification happening with these companies. It's not like apples to apples in my opinion, it never has been. And right. I think that's funny that people talk about it that way. Well, you're bringing up some great points. I want to guys bring up the next graphic because a lot of the things that John just said uh, are really relevant here. And what we're showing is that it's a survey data from ETR as our, our data partner, like 1400 plus CIOs and IT buyers. And on, on the vertical axis is this thing called net score, which is a measure of spending momentum and the horizontal axis is, is what's called market share. It's a measure of the pervasiveness or you know, number of mentions in the data set. And there's a couple of key points I want to I want to pick up on relative to what John just said. So you see AWS and Microsoft, they stand alone. I mean, they're the hyperscalers, they're far ahead of the pack. And frankly, they don't fall down to lose their lead. Uh, they spend a lot on CapEx, they got the flywheel effects going, they got both spending velocity and large market shares. And, and so, but they're taking a different approach, John, you're right. They're, they're living off of their SaaS estate, their software estate, uh, and, and they're, they're building that in to their cloud. So they got their sort of a captive base of Microsoft customers. So they've got that advantage. They also, as we'll hear from, from Microsoft today, they, they're building more abstraction layers. Andy Jassy has said, yeah, we don't want to be in that abstraction layer business. We want to have access to those you know, fine grain primitives and, 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 and so in, in, at an API level, so, so we can move fast with the market. But, if, but, but so those are sort of different philosophies, John. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, people who know me know that I love Amazon. I think their product is superior at many levels um, and, and it's way that it, that it has advantages. Again, they have a great SaaS and ecosystem. They don't really have their own SaaS play, although they're trying to add some stuff on. Um, I've been kind of critical of Microsoft in the past, but one thing I'm not critical of Microsoft and people can get this wrong in the marketplace, especially in the journalism world and also in just some other analysts, Microsoft has always had large scale. Um, so to say that Microsoft never had scale and that Amazon owned the monopoly on or franchise on scale is wrong. Microsoft had scale from day one. Their business was always large scale global. They've always had infrastructure with MSN and their search and the distributing how they distribute browsers in multiple countries. Remember, they had the lock on the operating system and the browser for until the government stepped in in 1997. And since 1997, Microsoft never ever not invested in infrastructure and scale. So that whole premise that they don't compete well there is wrong. And I think that chart demonstrates that they're in, they're in the hyperscale leadership category, hands down. The question that I have is that they're not as good in making that scale integrate in because they have that legacy card. So this is the classic innovators dilemma, Clay Christensen, right? So I think they're doing a good job. I think their strategy is sound. They're moving as fast as they can, but and, you know, they're not going to come out and say, we don't have the best cloud. Um, they, that's not a marketing strategy. You have to kind of hide in this and get better and then double down on where, where they're winning, which is clients are converting from their legacy at the speed of Microsoft and they have a huge client base. So that's why their stock is so high. That's why they're so good. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a little preview. I, I talked to JG Chirapirath, who's going to come on today and, and you'll see, I, I, I ask him because the criticism of Microsoft is there, you know, they're just good enough. And so I asked him, are you better than good enough? You know, those are fighting words if you're inside of Microsoft, but so you'll, you'll have to wait to see his answer. Now, if you guys, if you could bring that, that graphic back up, I wanted to get into the hybrid zone, you know, where the field is. We also you got, got some questions coming in on chat, Dave, so we'll get to those quickly. Great, awesome. So just, just real quick here, you see this hybrid zone, this is the, the field is bunched up and, and then the companies who have a large on-prem presence, 
and have been forced to initiate some kind of coherent cloud strategy included there is micro, micro, uh, multi-cloud and Google's there too, because they're far behind and they got to take a different approach than AWS. But as you can see, so there's some real progress here. VMware Cloud on AWS stands out as, a, as does Red Hat OpenShift. You got VMware Cloud, which is a VCF or a cloud foundation, even Dell's cloud. And you'd expect HPE with GreenLake to be picking up momentum in the future quarters. And you got IBM and Oracle, which there you go with the innovators dilemma, but they're, they're at least in the cloud game. And, and we can talk about that. Uh, but so John, you know, to your point, you've got to have different strategies. You're, you're not going to take out the big two. So you got to play, connect your prem, your on-prem to your cloud, your hybrid multi-cloud and try to create new opportunities and new value there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we'll get to the question, but just to that point, I think this it's, it's uh, Jerry Chen's come on theCUBE many times. We're trying to get him to come on lunch today with a featured startup, but um, he's always said on theCUBE, he's a VC at uh, Greylock, great firm, but Jerry's cloud genius. He's been there, but he made a point many, many years ago. It's, it's not a winner take all, it's a winner take most. And the big three, maybe put four or five in there will take most of the market share. But I think one of the things that people are missing and aren't talking about Dave, is that there's going to be a second tier cloud, large scale um, model. I don't want to say tier two cloud, it kind of makes it sound like it's sub, sub cloud, but a new category of cloud on cloud, right? So meaning if you look at what Snowflake did, I think this is a tell sign to what's coming. Uh, VMware cloud on AWS has had huge success, uh, mainly because Amazon is essentially enabling them to be successful. So I think there's going to be a wave of a, um, a more of a channel model of an indirect cloud build out where companies like the Cube, us potentially for media or others will build clouds on top of the cloud. So if Google, Microsoft and Amazon, whoever is the first one to really enable that, okay, will, will do extremely well because that means you can compete with their scale and create differentiation on top. So what Snowflake did is all on Amazon. Now they kind of shift up, go to Azure because it's you know politically correct to have multiple clouds and distribution and business model shifts but to get that kind of performance, they just wrote on Amazon. So there's nothing right. wrong with that because you're getting paid, it's variable, it's CapEx, OpEx, nice categorization. So I think that's a wave that we're watching. I think it's super valuable. I think we'll create some surprises in terms of who might come out of the woodwork uh, and be a leader in a category. Well, you, your timing is perfect, John. And we do have some questions in the chat, but before we get to that, I want to bring in Sarbjeet Johal, who's a, a contributor to, to our community. Uh, Sarbjeet, can you hear us? All right, so we got a- we Well, got while a, we we're bringing in Sarbjeet, let's go down some of the questions. So the first question, um, oh, Stu, we'll get to Stu the second, his first question, but, but uh, Ronald asked, can a vendor in 2021 exist without a hybrid cloud story? Well, story yeah. and capabilities, yes, they can live, but they have to have a story. <laughs> well, it, it, and if they don't own a public cloud, no. <laughs> I would say, no, they absolutely cannot. <laughs> hey guys. Hey, Sarbjeet, how you doing, man? Good to see you. So folks, let me let me bring in Sarbjeet Johal. He's a, he's a cloud architect, he's a practitioner, he's worked in the, as a technologist and, and is a, a frequent guest on, on theCUBE. Uh, good to see you, my friend. Thanks for taking the time with us. And good to see you guys too. Yeah, so he's we were kind of riffing on the competitive landscape. We got, we got so much to talk about. There's like I say, a number of, questions coming in, um, but Sarbjeet, we want to talk about, you know, what's happening here in cloud land. <clears throat> um, let, you know, let's get right into it. I mean, what do you guys see? I mean, we got we, yesterday, new regime, new inaug you know, inauguration. Do you, do you expect public policy? I'll start with you Sarbjeet to have, what kind of effect do you think public policy will have on, you know, cloud generally, specifically the big tech companies, the tech lash? Is it going to be more of the same or do you see a big difference coming? I think there, there will be some change in narrative, uh, uh, I believe. Uh, and that is mainly um, it, from the regulator side. The, the, a lot has happened in one month, right? So people I think are losing faith in high tech in, in a certain way. I mean, it doesn't, it, uh, I think it matters with camp, you belong to left or right kind of thing, right? But um, Parler getting booted out uh, from AWS, uh, I think that was huge. Um, like, how, how do you know that if a cloud provider will not boot you out? Um, like, what is that line? Where you draw the line? What are the rules? 
I, th I think um, that discussion has to take place. Another um, thing which has happened in the last two, three months is is the uh, solar winds um, hack, right? So not uh, U.S. not sort of acknowledging that it was Russia and then wishy-washing it. Now, um, new administration uh, might have a different sort of uh, posture on that. I think that's huge. I think public pu pu public private partnership and security arena uh, will emerge this year. Uh, we, we have to address that. Uh, yeah, I, I think right. that things are changing. Uh, economics, economy will change gradually. You know, we are coming out of a uh, pandemic. Uh, the money is still cheap and, and it will not be cheap for long. I think m and activity will pick up. So those are my uh, sort of high level. Uh, oh, oh, thank you. I, I want to come back to m and because there's a question in the chat about m and but John, how do you see it? Do you think Amazon and Google are on a slippery slope? Booting Parler off? Uh, I mean, how do they adjudicate between, well, what's happening on Parler? <laughs> Anything can happen on Clubhouse, who knows? I mean, I, can you use AI to find that stuff? Uh, uh, well, that's, uh, I mean, Amazon's right hiding, right? They're bunkered in right now from that bad, bad situation because again, like, like we said, Amazon, these all three cloud players win in, in the current environment, okay? Who wins with the US with the way we are? China, Russia, cloud players, okay? Let's face it, that's the reality. So if I wanted to reset the world stage, you know, what better way than to, you know, change over the United States economy, put people out of work, make people scared, and then reset the entire global landscape and control all the cash. That's, you know, conspiracy theory. So you see the riches, you see the riches get, the rich get richer. Yeah, well, that's, well, that's, that's I, kind I, of what's I, happening, right? So if you start getting into this idea that um, uh, you can't actually have an app on the site because of reason now, I'm not going to, I don't know the particulars of Parler, but apparently there was a reason, but this is dangerous, right? So what, what that's going to do is, and, and whether it's right or wrong or not, whether the political opinion is, it means that they were essentially taken offline by people that weren't voted for, that weren't, that weren't people didn't vote for. So that's not a democracy, right? So that's, that's a different kind of regime. What it's also going to do is you also have this groundswell of decentralized thinking, right? So you have a whole wave of crypto and decentralized um, uh, cyberpunks out there who want to decentralize everything. So all of this um, stuff in January has created a huge counterculture. And I had predicted this so many times on the cube, David, counterculture is coming. And, it, and you already have this kind of uh, counterculture between centralized and decentralized thinking. And so I think Amazon's move is dangerous at a fundamental level because if you can't get a, like if you can't get by domain names and you're completely blackballed by, by organized players, that's a mafia, in my opinion. Yeah. So well, you have to be Parler, careful. And, the, and it also fuels the decentralized movement because people say, hey, if that can be done to them, it can be done to me. Just the fact that it can be done will promote a swing in the other direction. I mean, independent of, of you know, again, Sub G said your political views. I mean, Parler would say, hey, we're trying to clean this stuff up. Now, maybe they didn't do it fast enough, but you think about how new Parler is. You think about early days of Twitter and, and Facebook. So they were sort of at a disadvantage trying to have- It was a, it was a parlor was what it was. It was a right wing stand up job of standing up something quick. Their security was terrible. If you look at, if we had Corey Quinn on, it'd be great to have him. And he did a great analysis on this because if you look at the lawsuit, it was just terrible security. It was just half ass. Well, and, this, and the experience was horrible. I mean, it's, a, it's not, not, it was not a great app, but, but like you said, it was a quick stand up, you know, for an agenda, you know, but nonetheless, you know, to Sarbjeet, to your point earlier, it's like, hmm, you know, are they going to, sh you know, shut me down if I say something that's, you know, uh, out of line or you know, how do I control that? Yeah, remember like a 2019 VM world um, closing uh, sort of remarks. I was there, I was saying that these companies are going to be too big to fail. And also they are too big for other nations to do business with uh, in a way. I think uh, MNCs are running the show worldwide. They are running the governments. They are. Yeah. Uh, we have seen the proof of that in US this year, I mean, late last year and this year. Um, uh, Twitter last night um, blocked um, Chinese embassy uh, in US um, um, from their, you know, platform last night. And I was like, what? What's going on? So, yeah. like, we used to, we used to say like. The, the, the Chinese company, tech companies are in bed with the Chinese government, right? Remember that? And yeah, now, and now actually, uh, I think Chinese people can say the same thing about U.S. companies. Uh, it's not a good thing. Well, right, let's hey, get some questions. Let's get here. some questions from the chat. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one was on M and A, and Subjit, you mentioned M and A. 
who do you see as <clears throat> possible M and A targets? I mean, I could throw a couple out there. Um, you know, some of the CDN players, maybe Akamai. You know, I like I like HashiCorp. I think they're doing some really interesting yeah. things. What, what do you see? <clears throat> I think HashiCorp and anybody who's doing things in the periphery is is a candidate um, for M and A by the big guys. You know, by the hyperscalers and number two, <laughs> tier two of hyperscalers, right? Um, that's like sales forces of the world and stuff like that. Um, some some companies, which I thought they will be a target, sort of um, M&A target, they are getting too big because of their valuations. I think HashiCorp is one. Um, and a bunch in the networking space, uh, uh, Voltara, if I say that right, that was uh, acquired by F5 this week, this week or last week, actually. Uh, late last week uh, for uh, $500 million. Um, I, I, know, I know their founder, so like I found that out. Yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot going on on the, on the network side, on the anything to do with data. Uh, that uh, Those are two hot areas in, in the cloud uh, arena. Data, <clears throat> data protection. John, any, any, anything you can add here? And I think, I mean, I think edge edge is going to be where the, the gaps are. And I think M&A activity is going to be where um, again, the big are too big to fail. I would agree with Sharbi on that one, but they're going to look at white spaces and say, a white space for Amazon is like a, <laughs> a monster space for a startup, right? So you're going to have these huge white spaces opportunities. And I think it's going to be an M&A opportunity big time for startups to get bought in. Given the speed, uh, and I think you're going to see it around databases and around some of these new service meshes and microservices stuff. I mean, that's- hey. There's a, there's a question here of somebody that Don's asking, why is Google who has the most pervasive tech infrastructure on the planet, not at the same level as other two hyperscalers. I'll give you my two cents is because it took them a long time to get their heads out of their ads. I wrote a piece of, around that a while ago. Yeah, uh, and they just, they, they figured out how to learn the enterprise. I mean, John, you've made this point a number of times, but they just kind of got a late start. Yeah, they're adding a lot of people. If you look at their, who they're hiring on the Google cloud, they're adding a lot of enterprise chops in there. They realized this years ago, and we've talked to many of the top leaders, although Kurian hasn't yet sit down with us, um, don't know what he's hiding or waiting for, but um, uh, they're clearly not geared up to, to compete. Uh, you can see it with some, some of the things that they're doing, but um, I mean, compete at the level of Amazon, but they have strengths and they're playing their strengths, but they definitely recognize that they didn't have the enterprise motions and the people and the DNA and that, Dave, it takes time to build in the enterprise. It's not for the faint of heart, it's unique. There's details that are different. You can't just you know, swing the Google playbook and saying, we're going to own the enterprise because our tech's great. They knew that years ago. So I think you're going to see uh, a good year for Google. I think you're going to see a lot of change. Um, they got some great people in there on the product marketing side, the biz dev, solution architects. And, and, the, and the SRE model that they have perfected has been strong. And I think security is an area that they can really add a lot of value in. So, um, always been a big fan of their huge network and all the intelligence they have that they could bring to bear on security. Yeah, I think Google's problem, main problem, there are two actually, there are many, but uh, one is that they don't, they didn't have the boots on the ground as compared to um, Microsoft, especially, and Amazon actually had the similar problem, but they had a, a the wide breadth of uh, their product portfolio. I always talk about uh, feature proximity in cloud context, like if you're doing one thing, you want to do another thing, and, and how do you go get that feature? Do you go to another cloud provider or it's right there where you are? So I think uh, Amazon has the feature proximity and they also have, uh, uh, as compared to Google, this uh, skills gravity, lots of people are trained on AWS. I think uh, Google is trying there. So second problem Google is having is that, um, that they're, they're more focused on, I believe, um, uh, on the data science part, uh, and they're, they're sort of skipping the core components, sort of uh, uh, of the cloud, if you will, the, the where the workloads needs, you know, basic stuff, right? Uh, that's like your compute, storage, and network, and that has to be well thought through. Um, yeah, I, I think um, they, 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 I think they will do good. Uh, well, with developers. so later today, Paul Gillen sits down with uh, Mitt Zavery. Of, of Google, he used to be at Oracle, he's with Google now. And he's going to push him on, on the numbers. You know, you're a distant third, does that matter? And of course, you know, you're just a preview of it's going to say, well, no, we don't really pay attention to that stuff. But John, you said something earlier 
that I, I, I think Jerry Chen made this comment that, you know, the, is it a winner take all? No, but it's a winner take a lot. You know, the number two is going to get a big chunk of the pie. Uh, it, it appears that the market's big enough for three, but, but do you, you know, does Google have to really dramatically close the gap uh, and be a much, much closer, you know, to the, to the leaders in order to, to compete in this race or can they just kind of continue to bump along siphon off the ad revenue, put it out there. I mean, uh, I Google wrote- definitely can compete. I think that's, look, I, Google's in it. They're not, they're not, they're not caving. <laughs> they're expanding. Right, so, but, 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 <laughs> but, 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 but I wrote, I wrote uh, recently that I thought they should even, even put more of an emphasis on the cloud. I mean, maybe, maybe they're already, you know, doubling down, but triple down. I just, I think that is a multi-trillion dollar, you know, future for the industry. And, you know, I think Google, believe it or not, could even do more. Now, maybe, there's just so much you can do. There's a uh, lot of challenges with these companies, especially Google, they're in Silicon Valley. We have a big social justice warrior mentality. Um, there's a big debate going on in the, um, in the um, back channels of um, the tech scene here. And that is, is that if you want to be successful in cloud, you have to have a good edge strategy. And that involves surveillance, use of data and pushing the privacy limits, right? So, you know, Google has people within the company that will protest contracts because AI is being used for war. Um, yet we have the most um, unstable in geopolitical scene that I've ever witnessed in my lifetime um, going on right now. So um, yeah. Well, don't you think that's what happened with Parler? I mean, Rob Hove said, hey, bar is pretty high to kick somebody off your platform, but Parler went over the line. But I would also think that a lot of the employees whether it's Google or AWS as well said, hey, why are we supporting you know, this? And so, to your point about social justice, I mean that's not something that that well, organizations. Parler was not just social justice; they were trying to throw the government over. That's Rob's point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for but sure. It, it, well, that's. I mean, I think they were in there nope. to get selfies and be protesters, but apparently there was evidence from what I heard in some of these clubhouse uh, private chats mm -hmm. was there was overwhelming evidence on Parler. Yeah, but my um, point is that the employee backlash was also a, a factor. That's that's all I'm saying. Well, no, if we have Google and these, when you have Google and you have employees that say, we will boycott and walk out if you bid on that Jedi contract, for instance, right? That Microsoft yeah. won from maybe. So, I mean, that's the warning. Well, I think, I think Tom Poole's making a really good point here, which is they, Google is an alternative to, to AWS. The last Google Cloud Next that we were asked at, they had a, it's all virtual this year, but I saw a lot of IT practitioners in the audience looking around for an alternative to AWS. Just seeing, you know, yeah. we can talk about mono cloud or multi-cloud, you know, Andy Jassy has his, his narrative around and he's true when somebody goes multiple clouds, they put, you know, most of their eggs in one basket. Nonetheless, I think, you know, Google's got a lot of people interested in, particularly in the analytics side, um, in, in an alternative and hedging their bets. Uh, so, and particularly use cases. So they should be able to do, so I guess my, the bottom line here is the market's big enough to have three leaders. You don't have to be the Jack Welch. I got to be number one and number two in the market. Is that the conclusion here? I, I think so, but the data gravity and the skills gravity are playing against them. The pro another problem which uh, I didn't, um, I wanted to cover this earlier was, was Google has is that they have to boot out AWS wherever they go, right? That is a huge challenge. Um, and most of the most of the Fortune 2000 companies are already using AWS in one way or another, right? So they are the multi-cloud kind of player, another one, you know? And uh, just pure, purely somebody going to 100% uh, Google Cloud, uh, those cases are kind of fewer, if you will. I think there's going to be absolutely multi-cloud. I think there's going to be a time where you look at the uh, marketplace and you're going to think in terms of disaster recovery model of cloud or just fault tolerant capabilities or you know look at the parlor or the next parlor or what if Amazon wakes up one day and says, hey, I don't like the Cube's commentary on their virtual events, so shut them down. We should have a failover to Google Cloud. Should Microsoft be an option? And what if people in Microsoft's ecosystem wants to buy services from us? We have to kind of co-locate there. So these are all open questions that are going to be the, the that'll become certain pretty quickly, which is, you know, can a company 
diversify their computing and IT in a way that works. And I think the momentum around Kubernetes you're seeing as a great connective tissue between, you know, having applications work between clouds, right? And well, the directionally correct in my opinion, because if I'm a company, why wouldn't I want to have choice? Well, so, let's talk about this. The, the data is mixed on that. I'll share some data, some ETR data with you. About half the companies will say, yeah, we're, we're spreading the wealth around to multiple clouds. Okay, that's one thing, I'll come back to that. About the other half are saying, yeah, we're predominantly mono cloud. We just don't have the resources. But what I think going forward is that, that what multi-cloud really becomes, and I think John, you mentioned Snowflake before, but I think that's an indicator of what, what true multi-cloud is going to look like. And what Snowflake is doing is they're building an abstraction layer across clouds. Ed Walsh would say, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. So they're, they're basically following, you know, points of presence around the, the globe and building their own cloud, they call it the data cloud with a global mesh. We'll hear yeah. more about that later today, but you sign on to that cloud. So they're saying, hey, we're going to build value because so they said Amazon's not going to build that abstraction layer across multi-clouds, at least not in the near term. Yeah. So that's <laughs> a real opportunity for people. Well, I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm dating becomes. myself, but, but you know, to date ourselves, Dave, I remember back in the eighties when you had um, open systems uh, movement, right? The part of the whole revolution OSI, um, open systems interconnect model. At that time, the, the networking stacks were SNA for IBM, DECnet for DEC. We all know that was a proprietary stack. And then in comes TCP IP. Now OSI never really happened on all seven layers, but the bottom layers standardized. Okay, that was huge. So I think if you look at AWS as some of the comments in the chat, AWS is, could be the SNA. <laughs> Depends how you look at it, right? You can say they're open, but in a way they want more Amazon. So Amazon's not out there saying we love multi-cloud. Why would they promote multi-cloud? They are a one of the clouds. They want that, all the business. That's interesting, John. And then Subjeet as a cloud architect. I mean, it's, it is not trivial to make your data cloud, if you're Snowflake, work on AWS, work on Google, work on, on, on Azure, be seamless. I mean, certainly the marketing says that, but technically that's not trivial. Uh, you know, there are latency issues. Uh, you know, so that's going to take a, a while to develop. What are your thoughts there? I, I think that multi-cloud for for same workload and multi-cloud for different workloads are two different things. Like we usually put multi-cloud in one bucket, right? Yeah, right. So I, I think you're right. If you're trying to do multi-cloud for the same workload, that that's a that's a complex um, uh, problem to solve architecturally, right? Uh, you have to have a common APIs and common, um, you know, control plane, if you will. And we don't have that yet. And then we will not have that for an, an, for at least for another couple of years. So uh, if you if you want to do that, then you have to go to the low, lowest common denominator in, in, in technical sort of stack, if you will. And then you are not leveraging the the best of the breed technology out there from different vendors, right? Um, I, I believe that's a hard problem to solve. And and another thing is that 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 I always say this. I'm always on the dev side, you know, developer side. I think um, to devs, public cloud is a proxy for innovative culture, right? So that's a catchphrase I have come up with to, to, uh, today during shower. <laughs> so um, I think that is true. And, and then people who are uh, companies. Um, who use the best of the breed technologies, they can attract the, these developers. Mm -hmm. And developers are the masons of this digital sort of em empires. A masonry is, is happening there, right? They, they are the masons, right? They lay, lay down the bricks. Uh, th I think if you don't appeal to developers, if you don't put, put um, uh, extensive for, you know, like force behind educating the market, then you can't, you can't put out. Hey, I want yeah, to take it's another. Same, it's the same game, statement story. We're seeing some chat comments. Uh, Jane yeah. Garg, she's a LinkedIn friend of mine. She's at Microsoft. If you go back and look at the Microsoft early days to the developer point, they were they they made their bones with developers. They were a software company. <laughs> so you know, hey, who could forget so developers? Could forget. Developers, developers, a sweaty if you were, on stage. Yeah, if you were in the developer ecosystem, you were treated as gold. You were part of the family. If you were outside that world, you were a competitor, and that was ruthless times back then. But again, they had it. That was where it was. Today, look at uh, where the software defined business is, as Sarveet's saying, it's all about being developer led in this new way to program, right? So the cloud, next gen cloud is going to look a lot like next gen developer and all the different tools and techniques are going to change. So I think, yes, 
this kind of developer ecosystem will be harnessed and that's the power source. It's just going to look different. So <laughs> Justin, so. J Justin in the chat has a comment. I just want to answer his question about elastic thoughts on elastic. Um, I, I tell you, Elastic has momentum. Uh, they're doing, doing very well in the marketplace. The Elk stack is a great alternative uh, that people are looking uh, to, to relative to Splunk, who people complain about the pricing. Now, of course, Splunk's got the easy button, but it is getting increasingly expensive. The problem with Elk stack is, you know, it's open source. It's, it gets complicated. You got to shard the databases. You got to manage it. Uh, so that's what Ed Walsh's company, Chaos Search is, is, is all about. But, but Elastic has some real momentum uh, in the marketplace right now. Yeah, Dave, you know, one of the things that come out of the chat that's just saying, I, was, I was saying about the open systems is Kubernetes I always felt was, and this is a bad metaphor, but it, you know, bear with me. It, that was the TCP IP for this modern era. See, TCP IP created that, that the disruptor to the SNAs and the network protocols that were proprietary. Mm -hmm. So what Kubernetes is doing is creating a connective tissue between clouds and letting the open source community fill in the gaps in a middleware kind of way. Uh, kind of probably a bad analogy, but that's where the disruption is. And if you look at what's happened since Kubernetes was put out there, what's it's become kind of de facto and standard in the sense that everyone's rallying around it. Same exact thing happened with TCP. It was people were, were trashing it. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah, it's not good. Of course they were trashing it because it was open. So, I find that to be very interesting. Yeah, that's a good analogy. Yeah. Sorry, G, you had a I think it's the RCA cable. I, 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 I use the RCA cable analogy, like the VCRs, um, when they started, they, they, every VC had, had, had their own cable and they will work only with that sort of brand of TV. And the RCA cable came and then now you can put any TV with any VCR and the VCR industry took off. Uh, there are so many examples out there uh, around uh, standards and how standards can, you know, uh, flare that fire, if you will, um, and to, to, uh, for an industry to go sort of wild. And, and another trend guys I'm seeing is that from the consumer side, let's talk about a little bit on the consuming side, um, is that the, B, the difference between B2B and B2C is blur blurred because even the physical products um, are connected uh, to the end user, like my door lock, the August door lock. I, I didn't just put got, got, get the door lock and forget about that. Like I, I value the experience it gives me or, or the problems it gives me on, on a daily basis. So uh, I'm close to that vendor, right? So, so the, the, the middle men uh, or middle people are getting removed uh, from uh, from the producer of the technology or the products uh, to the consumer, even even the the sort of uh, big uh, grocery players, they they have their apps now. Uh, how do you um, buy stuff and how it's delivered and all that stuff? It, that experience matters. In that context, I think um, having uh, to to be able to sell to these enterprises from the cloud provider providers, they have to have these case studies or or these sample sort of um, reference architecture and stuff like that. I think whoever has that more push that way, they, they, they are doing better. Like I, yeah. Amazon is Amazon because of that reason. I think they have lots of uh, sort of uh, use cases developed on top of them. And they, they themselves do retail like crazy, right? So, and other things as well, right? Hey, so I think that's a big trend. Yes, okay. great, great point, Sabi. One of the things, uh, there's a question in there about uh, from uh, Gadden who says, uh, I like the developer led cloud movement, but what is the criticality of the executive audience when educating the marketplace? Um, this comes up a lot in some of my conversations around automation. So automation has been a big way to automate this, automate everything. And then everything as a service has become kind of, kind of the, the, the executive suite kind of like conversation. We need to make everything as a service in our business. You've seen people move to that cloud model. Okay, so the executives think everything as a service is, is a business strategy, which it is at some level. But they, when they say, take that hill, do it, <laughs> developers, it's not that easy. And this is where um, a lot of our CUBE conversations over the past few months have been, especially during the, the COVID with CUBE Virtual. This has come up a lot, Dave, this idea and start beat around. It's easy to say everything is a service, but to go implement it, it's really hard. And I think that's where the developer-led connection is, where the executives have to understand that 
in order to just say it and do it are two different things. That digital transformation, that's a big part of it. So I think that you're going to see a lot of education this year around what it means to actually do that and how to implement it. I'd like yeah. to comment on the as a service and subject, get your take on it. I mean, I think you're seeing, for instance, with HPE GreenLake, Dell's come out with Apex, you know, IBM has its utility model. These companies are basically taking a page out of what I, what I would call a flawed SaaS model. If you look at the SaaS players, whether it's Salesforce or Workday, uh, ServiceNow, SAP, Oracle, these models are, 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 they're really, they're not cloud pricing models. They're, they're basically, you got to commit to a term one year, two year, three year. Well, we'll give you a discount if you commit to the longer term, but you're locked in. Uh, and you, you probably pay upfront or maybe you pay quarterly. That's not a cloud pricing model. And that's why I mean, they're flawed. You're seeing companies like Datadog, for example, uh, Snowflake is another one and they're beginning to price on a consumption basis. And that is, I think one of the big changes that we're going to see this decade is that true cloud, you know, pay by the drink pricing model. And to your point, John, to actually implement that is, you're going to need a whole new layer across your company. Uh, and, it's, and it's quite complicated. It, not even to mention how you compensate salespeople, et cetera, the, 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 the APIs of your product. I mean, it is that, but that is a big sea change that I see coming. Subjeet, your, your thoughts. Yeah, I, I think uh, like you can see it and like so, some things for this big tech um, execs are hidden in the plain sight. Right, they don't see it. They have blind spots. Like look at the look at Amazon. They went from millisecond to hundredth of a millisecond billing on serverless. Right, right. And then here you are, like you're saying, pay us for the whole year. If you don't use the cloud, you lose it. Or we'll pay by month per user and all that stuff. Right. That that those are old models. I think these players will be forced to use that kind of pricing, like per minute or per second per user. Uh, that way, uh, I think um, the Salesforce model is hybrid. They're struggling in a way. I think they are trying to bring the platform by doing you know, acquisition after acquisition to be a platform for other people to build on top of, but they are having a little trouble there because, because of their uh, such pricing and little closeness, if you will. And uh, I, again, I'm come, come going back to developers. Like if you are not appealing to developers who are writing the latest and greatest code, and it is open enough, by the way, open and open source are two different things as we all know that. So if your platform is not open enough, you will have, you know, some problems in closing the deals. I, I want to just bring up a question good on, on chat around um, from Justin Fittis, who says, um, can you touch on the vertical clouds um, as you're offering this? And um, he comes Oh, great question. End, great question. ECP announcing retail cloud and he mentions IBM with data. Okay, I'm huge on this point because I think this, I'm not saying this for years. <laughs> Cloud computing is about horizontal scalability and vertical specialization. And that's absolutely clear. And you see all the clouds doing it. The vertical rollouts is where the high fidelity data is. And with machine learning and the AI efforts coming out, that's accelerated benefits there. You have to have a vertical focus. I think it's super smart that clouds will have some sort of vertical engine, if you will, in the clouds that build on top of a control plane, whether that's data or whatever. This is clearly the winning formula. If you look at all the successful kind of AI implementations, the ones that have access to the most data will get the most value. So um, if you're going to have a data-driven cloud, you have to have this vertical feeling um, in terms of verticals, the data. Um, and so I think that's super important. And again, just generally as a strategy, I think Google doing a retail cloud is super smart because it, their whole pitch is we're not Amazon. Um, and some people say we're not Google, depending on what you look at. So every of these big players, they have dominance in areas and that scares companies. And some companies will never go to Amazon for that reason, or some right. people will never go to Google for other reasons. I know people who are in the ad tech business of like, uh, we're not we're not going to Google. So again, it is what it is, but this idea of vertical specialization, relevant, and super important. I, I, I want to bring to point out two sessions that are going on today. <clears throat> and I think great points. And I'm glad you asked that question. One is Alan Nance. He, he kicks off at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern time in the transformation track. And he's going to talk a lot about the coming power of ecosystems. And, and we've talked about this a lot that, that, that to compete with Amazon, Google, Azure, you've got to have some kind of specialization and, and vertical specialization is a good one. But of course you see in the big, the big three also get into that, but 
So he's he's talking at one o'clock, and then at at three thirty six p.m. I know these times are strange, but I can explain that later. Hillary Hunter is talking about uh, uh, she's the CTO of IBM, IBM's uh, uh, financial cloud, which is another really good example of of specifying vertical requirements and serving you know an audience. So, Abhijit, I think you have some thoughts on this. Um, actually. Um I lost my thought. <laughs> yeah, okay. I raised my finger. I, but, I think, but I think I, I think the other piece of that is data. I mean, to the extent that you can build an ecosystem, kind of back to Alan Nance's premise, around data. That, billions that, that of dollars data. in there. Data. There's billions of dollars, and that's the title of the session. But we did the trillion dollar baby post with Jassy and said cloud's going to be a trillion dollars, right? And so, and, and, and and the point of Alan Nance's session is he's thinking from an individual firm. Forget the millions that you're going to save shifting to the cloud on cost. There's billions in ecosystems and operating models. What's so deep Absolutely. The business it. value now, again, back to my half stack, full stack developer is the business value. And I've been talking about this on the clubhouses a lot this past month is uh, for the entrepreneurs out there. The, uh, the activity and the business value, that's the new, the new intellectual property is the business logic, right? So if you can see innovations in how work streams and workflows can be configured differently. You have now large scale cloud specialization with data. You can move quickly and take territory. That's much different scenario than a decade ago. Uh, I, I, and the point I was, was trying to make earlier was, uh, which I now remember is that, that having the horizontal sort of features is very important as compared to having vertical focus, you know, you're, you're more healthcare focused, uh, like you you have that sort of niche, if you will, and you're an auto or financials and stuff like that, what, what Google is trying to do. I think that's a, that's a good thing to cook up the reference architectures, but it's a bad thing in a way that you drive, drive away some developers but, uh, who are most of the developers at 80 plus percent developers are horizontal. Like you look at the look into the psyche of a developer. Like you move from company to company, and and only few developers will say, "I will stay only in healthcare," right? So I will only stay in auto or something like that, right? So they you have to have these horizontal capabilities which can be applied anywhere, uh, and, and then well, I think on that's true. That, I, 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 I think that's true, Sarvi, but I would take a little bit different take on that. I would say, yes, that's true. But remember, remember the old school application developer? If someone was just called an application developer, all they did was develop applications, right? They, they picked the framework, they did it, right? So I think we're going to see more of that. There's just now more of under the covers developers. You've got more software-defined networking and software-defined storage servers and cloud, Kubernetes, and that's kind of like under the hood. But you've got your you know classic application developer. I think you're going to see a lot of that come back in a way that's like, I don't care about anything else. And that's the promise of cloud infrastructure as code. So I think there's both. Hey guys. I, work, I worked at PeopleSoft and, and I uh, still today I say, um, in, in today's context, I would say ERPs are the ultimate low code, no code uh, sort of thingies, right? And, but the problem is they couldn't evolve. They couldn't make it lightweight, right? Yeah. So um, they, I, I used to write applications with drag and drop, you know, stuff, right? Yeah. But, um, but I was miserable as a developer. I didn't didn't want to be in the applications division of people software. I wanted to be on the tools division. There were two divisions in most of these big companies, SAP, Oracle, uh, like companies, the divisions, right? One is the cooking up the tools. One is cooking up the applications. The, the, the best developers always go, go hey to guys. the tooling. Hey guys, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're almost out of time. I just wanted to tease some of the, the sessions of the day. First of all, we got Holger Muller coming on at, uh, at lunch for a little, little power half hour. Um, you'll, you'll notice when you go back to the homepage, you'll notice that calendar, that linear clock that we talked about, that start times are kind of weird. Like for instance, Anna Pinzuk's coming on at 124. And that's because these are pre-recorded assets and rather than having a bunch of dead air, we're just streaming one to the other. So, so she's going to talk about people, process and technology. We got Kathy Southwick, who's a, a Silicon Valley CIO, Dan Sheehan, was the CIO of Duncan Brands, and and he he was actually the COO. So it's CIO, CIO connecting the dots to the business. Uh, Daniel Denez is the CEO of of UiPath. He's coming on at 2:47 p.m. East Coast time. Uh, one of the hottest companies, probably the fastest growing software company in history. We got a guy from Bain coming on, Dave Humphrey, who invested 750 million dollars in Nutanix. He'll explain why. And then, ironically, Deeraj Pandey, Stu Miniman, our friend, interviewed him. That's 3:35. One of the sessions I'm most excited about today is 
Jamak Degani at 4.03 p.m. East Coast time. She's going to talk about how to fix broken data architectures, really forward thinking stuff. And then that's the, so that's the transformation track. On the future cloud track, we start off with the big three. Maylon Thompson Bukovec at one o'clock. She runs AWS's storage business. Then I mentioned JG Chirapirath at 1.30. He runs Azure's analytics business. He's awesome. Paul Gillen then talks about Amit Zavery at, at, at 1.59. And then our friend Stu um, talks about uh, interview Simon Crosby. I think, I think that's it. I think we're going on to our next session. All right, so keep it right there. Thanks for watching theCUBE on cloud. <laughs>